Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about uh, universal dynamical decoupling and quantum works in functional space. So this work is done in collaboration with uh, Adelaide and Beckoff from Rice University. And if you're interested in details, you can find it in the archive paper. And I also will recommend, and you can also take a look at uh, Quo and Lita's paper, which also have related uh, topic. And so, First of all, like, uh, since we're here in a conference for quantum information processing, one of the biggest challenges is actually decoherence. And decoherence can be induced by system and the bus interaction. And for example, we consider a system of a single qubit. The most generic system and bus interaction can be written in the form, which is just a sum of the system generators tensor, uh, tensored with uh, the corresponding bus operator. So here it's actually, mm, we try to so, um, and you may see that these bus operators, they have a hat, so they may not commute with each other. And in addition, these system operators, they also do not commute with each other. So this actually makes the problem a little more hard to keep track of. And so, um, so the idea is actually to <coughs> suppress, um, because, so in the presence of the system bus interaction, they will induce an entanglement between system and the bus and uh, which leads to the decoherence of the system. So the idea of using dynamic de decoupling is to introduce additional system evolution so that the overall evolution, which is combined with the system bus and the system evolution together, it will become just the identity of the system tensor with some unitary operation on the bus. So if we can achieve that, then there will be no, more, no entanglement between the system and the bus. And so in, in this talk here, I'll particularly focus on this universal dynamical decoupling, which efficiently decouples the system from bus for arbitrary system and bus interaction. So here universal means these bus operators can be arbitrary, but with a finite norm, of course. <coughs> so and one, and before we talk about this universal decoupling sequence, let's first take a look at this uh, Han echo sequence, which we are all very familiar with. So the Han echo sequence consists of two pulses which is a pi pulse in the halfway of evolution that flips the spin, and at the end of the evolution, it flips the spin back. So if we consider this, uh, and high echo sequence can efficiently suppress this uh, defacing noise, which can be induced by the system operator SZ tensor with the bus operator BZ. And let's look at how um, the system bus Hamiltonian, an uh, interaction Hamiltonian evolves in the presence of this system evolution. And it's, it's convenient to, to introduce this toggling frame Hamiltonian, which you can think it as uh, an interaction Hamiltonian associated with uh, the convolution. So in the toggling frame Hamiltonian, what happens is the first term, which acts trivially on the system, commutes with all the operations on the system. So there is no, um, no change to this term. But the second term, the SZ, which actually anti-commutes with the pulse. So the first half of the evolution, it, there's no sign change of this term. <coughs> but in the second half, there is uh, additional minus sign. So then we can compute the unitary of this evolution, which is, consists of two, two sequential evolutions. And uh, we can keep track of the term and get this uh, suppression, which uh, the, the system bus interaction gets suppressed to the second order. So actually this example actually outlines the procedure that we, we can use to keep track of this universal dynamic decoupling, which is first we write down the system bus interaction, then we write down this toggling frame Hamiltonian, and the last step, we compute the unitary associated with this toggling frame Hamiltonian. So which is outlined here, system bus, toggling frame Hamiltonian, and in the end, we'll compute the And for this, um, and actually there have been a lot of studies about this universal dynamical decoupling. <coughs> and uh, lots of sequences are proposed and proved, and lots of sequences are conjectured to be universal. So here is just uh, probably an incomplete list, but uh, consists of most of the features. But uh, maybe it's a little bit overwhelming to see all these on the same in the same figure, so I tried to come up with a, a family tree for all these dynamical decoupling sequences. So the, grand, uh, the great grandfather for all these sequences is actually the Han echo. And uh, actually there could be like a two different kinds of uh, decoupling sequences, approaches. One is called the concatenated dynamical decoupling, which uh, and Daniel also mentioned in his talk in tutorial on Monday. And the other one is the Ulrich de decoupling, which is a little more efficient, basically use order of n pulses to suppress the, this decoupling to the higher order. And, but these two sequences, uh, <coughs> but this URIG only suppresses the, the defacing noise qubit 
So we might want to protect the entire qubit from both defacing and bit flip noise. So that goes to the second generation of this dynamical decoupling sequence. So for concatenated sequence, you can actually, and there's a way to actually suppress both defacing and the bit flip. And for the Ulrich sequence, if you nest it with the two nesting levels, which gives you the quadratic dynamical decoupling for the Ulrich sequence. And uh, you can also combine the concatenated with the Ulrich sequence, come up with some concatenated Ulrich decoupling or Ulrich concatenated decoupling. So the ordering here corresponds to the, what, which, which comes the high order, which, which corresponds to the lower order decoupling. And, and so we can go even further. The third generation corresponds to the decoupling sequence, which can protect <coughs> m qubit quantum systems. So here it, you may have some and the cohere, uh, system bus interaction which might evolve like a multi-qubit, like x1, x2 times the bus operator. And uh, by having this, uh, um, this deep, um, um, decoupling sequence for n-qubit systems, those terms will be eliminated as well. So um, it, natural generalization will be nested concatenated decoupling sequence or nested Ulrich decoupling sequence. Um, but as you see that, okay, on the upper right, uh, upper left <coughs> side of these sequences, they are all proved to be universal. But on the lower left, which is still open questions, we don't know if they are universal or not, but they're conjectured to be. And it's important to understand these sequences because they are much, they are very efficient, which scales polynomially with the order you want to suppress. <coughs> so in the rest of the talk, I'll try to um, convince you that indeed, all these sequences, they are universal. So before going to the proof, let's first take a look at the uh, and just to recap what the uh, Ulrich dynamical decoupling sequence is. So Ulrich dynamical decoupling sequence is actually a, 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 an unequally spaced decoupling sequence. So the pulses, not, the spacing between the pulses are not equal. They're actually obtained by some equal partition over a half, hem, half, half sphere, uh, a half circle, <coughs> and then projected along this uh, horizontal axis. And you, for example, here n equals to two, so you have two pulses which kind of correspond to these two points on the circle. And, uh, and for example, if I want to suppress defacing noise using, <coughs> uh, uh, defacing noise using Ulrich dynamical decoupling, um, we can apply spin flip operators at these two, at these two, uh, at, th at these two times. So um, what happens is that uh, the system Hamiltonian consists of two terms, uh, which one is act trivially on the system, the other act induces defacing of the system. And the, the, the one acts trivially on the system, the coefficient doesn't change. The one that induces the defacing of the system, which actually induces, uh, which has a bit, uh, which changes sign every time it hit this spin flip operator because it's anti-commutes this operator. So overall, uh, the message is, okay, we know what this F function is. It's just the sum of plus one or minus ones. And the additional feature is that you may find that if we multiply these two F functions with different sub-index, so here, and alpha takes the value zero and one, corresponds to trivial operator or the SZ operator. So when you multiply these two F functions, it turns out there is a simple rule that it becomes another F function with the index becomes the binary sum of these two sub-indexes. So this is an important feature. And you may find that this has a similar correspondence in the system operator. When you multiply two system operators with alpha to be zero or one, it becomes another system operator which and the indices correspond to the binary sum of these indices. Because it's, in some sense it's trivial because SZ is uh, just a SZ squared identity. But you will find that actually it becomes a little non-trivial when we go to the case for the quadratic dynamical decoupling, which we have a system. Uh, so here we will consider uh, the system uh, of a single qubit, which has a SX, SY, and SZ coupling to the bus. So now we have, uh, generically we can write the four terms in the system bus interaction, and here I'll label it with the zero, uh, two binaries, zero, zero, up to one, one. Um, and, and so first, um, we consider um, the decoupling sequence for this uh, uh, quadratic dynamic decoupling, it consists of a, concat a nested Ulrich decoupling. So in each interval of the original Ulrich dynamic decoupling sequence, you put another Ulrich inside here. So therefore, um, so you have like a, a one Ulrich sequence at the high le highest level, and the here for n equal to two, you have a three like Ulrich sequence at the lower level. And so we can compute these f functions as the following. And the, so for example, this uh, associated with SZ function, which you will find change the sign every time it hits this SX operator. 
And similarly, we can get the F function associated with the SX operator and SY operator. And the feature is, you, again, you confirm this uh, feature uh, property is a product of two F function is another F function, but with the indices corresponds to the binary sum of the, the two, um, of the two inputs. And here, similarly, the S function and the system operator function also have the same feature. It's a product of the two is another system operator with the indices being the binary sum, but up to some plus or minus sign. But here it doesn't matter because actually later on we'll show that it equal to zero, so plus or minus zero, it's still zero. But keep these two features in mind as we'll use it later. Um, so just to recap, what we, how we prove the universal dynamical decoupling, it develops three steps. We write the system bus interaction, we go to the toggling frame, and we compute the unitary evolution. So we have already go through the first two steps. The next step is to compute the unitary evolution. And the goal is to show this unitary is essentially identity acting on the system plus some high order terms. So the way to do it is uh, by doing Dyson expansion. So this is the unitary, then the, the standard Dyson formula gives us uh, a bunch of terms and here n corresponds to the little n corresponds to the number of integrals associated with uh, these extension terms. And uh, in addition, uh, so you can plug in this Hamiltonian, which consists of a bunch of terms, and which, uh, which you can sum all these over. But the important thing is, here you have n integrals. That will give you power t to the n, because that's the only way you can get uh, the total t, which is the total evolution time. And uh, the rest of the term consists of three, three components. First, it's a coefficient, which is associated with the time-dependent f function induced from this uh, decoupling sequence. And the second component is the system operator, which is a product of these s operators. But it's important to keep track of the ordering of the system operator. And the last term is the bus operator, which is a product of all those bus operators. And uh, um, so here is just like the definition right out explicitly. So just recall that early on we say the system operator, the product of the two is an again system operator, but with the index is a binary sum. So we can generalize this to n product of system operators, which is a binary sum of n indices. It's again a system operator. And this system operator becomes identity only if the binary sum of these indices is zero. And so, and so if, we write, if we look at this Dyson expansion here, we'll find that, uh, okay, the goal is to hope and to show that this one is equal to some identity act on the system plus some high order term, which means all the lower order terms zero. That means that this f function should be zero for all those lower order terms when n is less than the capital N. But except for some, um, but this is a little too restrict because actually um, this, if for this expansion, if the system operator here is identity, it's actually okay because it does not uh, um, perturb our system. So we can actually exclude those terms by putting a constraint that uh, this system operator is not equal to identity in those expansions uh, when we try to compute this F term, <coughs> which corresponds to the binary sum of those alphas in this F function is not equal to zero. So as we can show that uh, F is, Ft is determined by polynomial number of pulses and as we said earlier. And, uh, but surprisingly, you may find that here, if you count the number of equations, it actually scales exponentially with the number of, um, with the order you want to suppress because alpha can take two or four values and here you have actually uh, n possible choice of alpha, so it will go to the four to the n or two to the n. So it's kind of a surprise why this will ever work because we have a polynomial number of um, variables but the exponential number of constraints. But this exponential number of constraints, they actually have some properties in there. You may find that the number of integrals is always less than capital N. So this might tell us something that, okay, maybe we can use this property to suppress it, uh, to show this is, all these exponential number of constraints can be satisfied. So how to show it? So um, I would like to list uh, five steps to show how this will vanish. So first we use the property, just recall early on, that the product of two f functions is another f function with indices being the sum of the previous two. And with this, you can, we can rewrite this f function in terms of a bunch of integrals. But here, it's just like a, we try to uh, squeeze this f, uh, dependent f into this integral by uh, making this definition. 
And once we did it, essentially we only left behind with this uh, little n number of integrals. And in addition, there is uh, one leftover f function which corresponds to um, the product of all these f functions at the end. So if you look at this um, definition, a new definition for this f function, you can think it as, you can take a perspective. This is uh, some evolution of a function. So you start from identity, which is a trivial function. Then you multiply it with a f function. It becomes a function of t1. The next step, you do an integral. It maps from t1, a function of t1 to a function of t2. Then next time you do an integral, it maps from t2 to t3 and so on. In the end, it maps to a function of tn minus 1 before it hits the last integral. That will spit out the number. And we, so it just keep this in mind that we essentially have n steps of evolutions of the functions. And we would like to find some generic feature evolution of functions that are independent of these beta 1, beta 2, up to beta n. And so and in order to see it, to facilitate the computation, we actually, it's, it will be convenient to switch to functional basis. And the choice of functional basis is, is the following. First, these, uh, the time dependent like, uh, coefficients in the toggling frame Hamiltonian, it's a discontinuous function. So that's why we actually uh, would like to have our functional basis also contain this discontinuity. And one way to do it is actually to have a step function uh, in between two pulses. And the, since we have all together Q pulses, there will be Q such step functions. And in addition, there will be some integrals. And each integral over a polynomial, it will increase the polynomial power by one. So that's why actually we also, in, in our functional basis, we also include the polynomial. So this gives our functional basis. And uh, then it's just like a translated language of this functional operator in uh, a functional ops in the functional basis, which will be represented by matrices or vectors. So here is just a, a table that uh, lists these operations in terms of uh, um, matrices and vectors. So, but maybe I'll just skip these details a little bit. So the next step is actually we will find that uh, these, uh, the previous matrices, like these ones, they actually block diagonal, have some block features. So we can get rid of these block features and go to a reduced matrix, which will be the size of the matrix will be proportional to the number of pulses you apply to the system. So in the end, um, we, got to, we got to the form that uh, this f function is just the sum of all these terms with some coefficients. And these terms are the feature that uh, the total power of these D matrices, if we sum together, it's less than N. So essentially, we are multiplying an, a number of D matrices, but the total number of D matrices is less than N. So the, then here is the last step. And, and the last show that this is zero. So, and hence, the F will also be zero. And this can be shown by, first we try some numerics. And the later on, it's like, okay, a nice way to illustrate is to find a nice basis for the functions so that we start from some function, which you say, okay, it's correspond to this dot here. Then every time we multiply a D matrix, it increase, it change the index by at most one. Then, so once we multiply a D matrix, it change the index by one. So it's go from, it, it, it explore the, the original origin point and also its neighbor. The next time we multiply D matrix, it explores the second nearest neighbor. So we multiply the D matrix multiple times until it hits this boundary. The boundary corresponds to the vector associated with the other side of the operator. So, um, and, and you will find that actually for this uh, Ulrich case, it's a one-dimensional quantum work, and the, the functional basis uh, convenient to use is associated with the free. And similarly, we can go to two dimension, which we find that uh, uh, which we can get the same thing. But for two, two dimension, just recall the URI uh, quadratic dynamical decoupling sequence. It's a concatenated sequence. So we need the two indices to associate with the first level and the second level. So this will correspond, this will give us a two dimensional quantum work. And uh, we can find these functional ba uh, convenient basis by some like a Fourier transform with a shift. And uh, it's, it's actually because of this shift which makes it a little hard to prove of this quadratic dynamical decoupling. But the, the message is clear, it's just um, we need to take n steps of uh, D matrices <coughs> before we hit the boundary, which gives a non-vanishing value of this integral. So, and, and the w one last comment is actually this proof can be generalized to this uh, nested Ulrich dynamical decoupling and, and all the other CDD, CUDD, UCDD sequences. And, uh, and also, it, this proof can also be generalized 
and to these cases where the original may have some time dependence, but this time dependence is an analytic function of time. So finally, just uh, in this uh, family tree, we can show that all these guys, they are universal indeed. And just the uh, outlook, and so far we have only considered the m qubit system, which generically you can write correspond to the SU2 to the m group. But more generally, you can write SUM, where m is the number of levels. And it's actually not clear if these case for SUM, we can achieve a universal dynamical decoupling sequence. So there have been some ideas of using cyclic Ulrich dynamic decoupling, which I think is related to yesterday's talk, and we're also thinking about something similar in this direction. Or maybe it would be nice to have some numerics to show, okay, maybe there are such universal dynamical decoupling sequence exists for this N level, M level systems. Yeah, thank you. Little thank you again. <laughs> any, qu any questions? Yes, Leonid. How do you then or can you extend this to the standard for finite width pulses? Oh, for to finite width pulses? Yes, <laughs> actually, we are, um, yeah, Adelita and I are discussing it during the conference. So it seems possible. And uh, the trick is probably, okay, we need to generalize the formalism, right? And, uh, and so here the F is just the number, which is probably not enough. But we can, <laughs> we can generalize it. But, but okay. <laughs> still in progress, so yeah, we'll see. So because you're considering quantum walks, is it possible to consider errors inside of the quantum walk? I mean, as errors inside the URIG um, uh, scheme? And yes, it depends on what you want to do, right? If you want to show it's universal, then probably you, you want to make sure all those errors doesn't show up in the quantum work. And the make, make uh, one's probably important property is these errors, they okay, always go to nearest neighbor instead of to a second nearest neighbor, or so on. Yeah, mm, that's prob yeah, that's something we can think of. Yeah. If you remember the presentation of Mike Birchuk, he showed that UDD suffers severely if you take finite time resolution into account. I assume you would have the same problem here? And yes, and, and, but I guess usually the time resolution <coughs> probably in principle can be improved quite a lot because we have good atomic clocks. And but that's not the matter of good time. If there is enough time, but you have the system hmm. which has operates on a clock which has a finite rate. Yes. And it's not a matter of precision or stability, it's yeah. a matter of resolution. Okay, I would say like a probably a in, in this sense, the UDD might not be the optimum against the such like uh, errors. Yeah. Just uh, one uh, trivial, easy question I ask you. Uh, what is the, uh, what can you say about the radius of convergence of your uh, expansion? Because if it does not, uh, if it has a zero radius of convergence, there's no point in perturbation theory. And yes, so, so actually there's some work on this, but, um, but here, mm, and one simple answer is that if the Hamiltonian, system bus interaction Hamiltonian is bounded, then that's what corresponds to the convergence. That's but you need the condition on the time of the sequence also, because that's the main. Yes, so, so actually, mm, so far I can, I can say, okay, from this, and there is a, a bound which might not be the optimum, which is corresponds to the inverse of the system bus interaction, take the inverse, that corresponds to the time. Right, okay. Yeah. Let us thank you again. <laughs> you like the next speaker?